you the story of champion drivers of the 1960s and 1970s. This time we concentrate on Belgium's Jackie Ix, twice a runner-up in the World Championship, and England's Brian Redmond, one of the most entertaining and best sports car drivers of all time. Jackie Ix rose to prominence through saloons. He then had a successful career in Formula 2, coming to the notice of Jackie Stewart. He had enormous natural ability and was great in wet weather. In 1969, he joined Brabham and finished second in the World Championship to Jackie Stewart. He seemed to have all the talent, but Brabham designer Ron Turanak puts it into perspective, comparing him with Jochen Rindt and Dan Gurney. Uh, I, I was much closer to Rindt than the others. Um, we actually roomed together during the year he drove for us, and uh, he's a very likeable guy. Dan, of course, just flew in from America and did the race and went back again, so one, one didn't get the same relationship with him, but he was equally fast. Um, Ix, I would say, a strange person. I got along well with him, but uh, he was a bit more like a spoilt schoolboy or a prima donna. Uh, he, I think when he was on his own, when Jack uh, broke his ankle, he raised to great heights. And in fact, in one classic race, uh, beat Stewart at, um, in Canada. Mossport Park. In fact, Stewart went off the road when they were, he was being passed. Um, so he, he could rise to those heights if he felt everything was behind him. And so too could Brian Redman, so, who also drove for Ferrari. Well, it wasn't that. I, I was invited to drive the Formula 2 car and I went to test it at Modena and uh, engineer Fagheri was in charge of the test and part way through, about lunchtime, he pointed across to the trees and he said, Brian, you see over there? And there was this raincoated figure. He says, it's Signor Ferrari, you know, to make me go faster. So I tried a bit harder. And they asked if I'd drive the car at the Nürburgring on the Sudschleife, which is still a very difficult track, uphill and down dale, uh, and about four miles around instead of eight miles around. And I, in practice, I did fine. I was fine. The car was nice. I liked it. And I came in 10 minutes from the qualifying. And Fagari said to me, why you come in? I said, uh, I've gone as fast as I can. He said, go out and try harder. So I went and drove like a maniac. He said, you're in 10th place. And I went a tenth of a second faster. And I'd been in fourth place all along. So I was pretty unimpressed with this. And so in the race, I was lying fourth in a tight bunch. Jackie Hicks, the team leader in the Ferrari, was first. Uh, Piers Courage was second in the Brabham. And Kurt Ahrens, the German, was third. And I was just behind Kurt. We came past the start and finish line on the fourth lap, and I got a stone through my goggle here. And I thought it had hit me in the eye, and I braked, flung my hand up, flung my goggles off, and I went like this. And then I went around the track, another four miles at very slow speed, came into the pits, and Gary said, Brian, Brian, what's your stop? I said, eh. And he went, it's OK, where are your spare goggles? I said, I don't have any. And he flung me Ix's spare goggles, which were dark green. And I drove like a madman and I set a new record lap and finished fourth in the race. And uh, when I got back into the hotel room, I sat on the bed and I just went, I'm gonna get killed, I thought. <laughs> so that night in dinner, he, for Gary went and he came back, he said, Brian, I speak with Signor Ferrari, and for the rest of the year, you drive a Formula 2, Formula 2, and at the end of the year, Formula Uno. And I said, no. I said, if I drive for Ferrari, I'll be dead by the end of the year. Brian is better known as a sports car driver. Did he prefer them? <laughs> no, I prefer open-wheel single-seaters. I was uh, the American Formula 5000 champion in 1974, 5 and 6, with a certain Mario Andretti finishing second in 74 and 5, and Alan Cecenia finishing second in 76, and I prefer single-seaters. They're so much more accurate than a sports car, even though, like the 312 PV, that was really a Formula One car with a body and made bigger, you know, for, to take two seats. But all the running gear was Formula One. But single-seater races are much more intense, you know, it's focused. One hour, two hours, perhaps, ba ba ba, no compromise. But a sports car race, uh, you have to look after the car, you have to look after the gearbox, which means being a little bit more careful. And yes, you do have some great races, 
but uh, the single seater is nicer, you know, it's more fun, really. Chris Amon's win in the 1969 Tasman Championship was perhaps the pinnacle of his single seater success. Here, he took on the very best of the opposition, including Jochen Rint, Graham Hill, and Piers Courage, and beat them all. He stayed with Ferrari to prove he had the pace, but 1969 wasn't a success, and he left the team in 1970 to go to March Engineering with their new March 701. He was replaced at Ferrari by Jackie Ix. Frank Gardner and Jochen Rindt chat together in 1969. Eamon took a number of places for March, but moved on to Matra and almost gave them a win as well. He also drove for the embryonic Ensign team, and it was there that he finished his Grand Prix career before retiring back to New Zealand. Chris Eamon's win in the 1966 Le Mans 24-hour race was with the big 7-litre Ford. When joining Ferrari in 1967, he was in cars that were outpaced by the Ford effort over the next three years, and then faced the rise of Porsche. In 1968, Ford pulled their works team out of sports car racing, but the program continued with the John Wire Golf team. Its number one driver was Jackie Ix, and in the lineup were Mike Halewood, Brian Redman, and Derek Bell. When Ford had built the GT40, they'd expected the original 4.2 liter engine to do the job. They needed a few more liters in the end, but the original engines were reworked with Gurney Wesleyke heads and the John Wire team were able to win Le Mans in 1968. For 1969, it appeared that the GT40 would be too old. The car that was expected to beat it was the 917 Porsche, of which nearly 50 examples had been built so that it qualified as a production car. The drivers run across the road for the start of the 1969 Le Mans 24 hour, the last start of this kind. Joe Siffert was one of the favorites in the three liter long tailed Porsche. Jackie X was last away, making sure his seatbelts were done up. In the early stages, the Fords were down in 10th and 11th places, but gradually the steamroller of Porsche began to run out of steam. The long tail bodywork caused the gearbox oil to overheat. Hushke von Hanstein and David York presided over the greatest battle in the 24 hour race. In the final hour, Porsche and Ford GT40 exchanged places, young Jackie Ix and the veteran Hans Hermann, ex-Mercedes-Benz. On the very last lap, the win went to the GT40 of the two Jackies, Ix and Oliver. It was the beginning of the Ix legend at Le Mans, six wins in total. The start of my racing career into a prototype passed through that uh, GT40. Um, it's unbelievable to have here today the car I used 20 years ago and also the car I won Le Mans two times. But as far as I'm concerned, the GT40 being my first sport car to drive, and that was a car run by John Ware at the time. I think it was really a car performing very, very well. Considering that Ford we draw with the Mark II and other cars officially, the car was taken by John Ware and uh, developed. And for three years in a row, the car could compete with um, the works Porsche car and very with a lot of efficiency. And we won with Brian Redman a lot of, a lot of 
major races. What's the secret of doing well at Le Mans? I think you've got uh, the secret is that first you have to be extremely lucky and second you have to be in uh, one of the best possible team in Le Mans Other, otherwise you would win. If you are assisted by a very good co-driver then your chances increase too. But I think uh, the success is a lot of luck I believe. Well, Brian is still a professional driver today and I think I retired for now about four or five years so he's not the number one in the team and it's nice to be uh, with him because when we were together uh, I was probably the peak of my career and he was probably uh, the best co-driver you could dream about but unfortunately uh, he, were, he was probably uh, underestimated uh, in a way, but he was the most perfect co-drive you could dream about. And that's the reason why we share so many successes. And without him, I think I couldn't have, I couldn't have been so successful. Jochen Rindt won the World Championship posthumously in 1970. It was Jackie X's best year in Formula One, and he could have won the title. March was also having their first year in Grand Prix racing, and Chris Amon was at the wheel, together with Joe Siffert, of the red STP-sponsored cars. This is the British Grand Prix, where Jack Brabham famously ran out of petrol while in the lead. X was a retirement, and the McLarens didn't show well either in Dan Gurney's comeback race, so Rint was able to take the win from a disappointed Brabham. Hicks's problem in Formula One was that he disliked testing, and by now it was necessary to spend time doing that if you were going to be successful. In the Italian Grand Prix, the race for which, in practice, Rint had lost his life, Ix drove a fine race, but it was his Ferrari teammate Clay Regazzoni who took the win. Emerson Fittipaldi spoiled Ix's chance of taking the championship, and he never really had another opportunity. Ix drove for Lotus, Ligier and Williams towards the end of his career, but Grand Prix racing required more effort than Jackie was prepared to give, and this was really his downfall. He compensated with more sports car and long-distance rally victories. After their win in the 1969 Le Mans, John Wire's team were invited to try a different car, and so came about the famous Gulf Porsche 917s. On the driving staff, the likes of Joe Siffert, Pedro Rodriguez, and Brian Redman. Siffert and Rodriguez were immensely quick. Rodriguez was particularly good in the rain, but like Ix, had a distaste for testing. The Gulf Porsches won a succession of races, despite the fact that Porsche entered another team via Austria to try and take the crown away. When not with the 917, the 3-litre 908 was still a useful car for events such as the Targa Florio. Always playing his part in these races was Brian Redman, the unsung hero of Porsche, Ferrari and Ford. Spa, these cars were quicker than the Formula Ones. Redman and Siffert were often paired together. It was a good match. Of all the drivers, Brian Redman had the longest top line career, and he really enjoyed his time with Porsche. They were really terrific, and in fact, I drove for Ferrari for two years and for Porsche for two years, so, uh, but somehow those 69 and 70 in the Porsche, which was the first time they'd won the World Championship, somehow seemed a bigger thing than when I drove for Ferrari, who also won the World Championship in 1972, and then I drove again in 73. And in both cases, the teams were terrific, and we had none of the famous Ferrari histrionics, the throwing and the yelling. We didn't have any of that. The team was run by the Swiss, Peter Shetty, it was superbly run, and uh, I, I only met Enzo Ferrari once. 
I went to Maranello and I was invited to lunch and he only spoke uh, two words to me. You know what he said? He got hold of my cheek and he went, nice a boy. That was it. <laughs> If Porsche's 1969 Le Mans race was a disappointment, things were much better in 1970. Victory in 1970 went to the man who had lost out the previous year, Hans Hermann, partnered by Dickie Atwood, and this was Atwood's greatest victory. He enjoyed it so much that he still runs a 917 Porsche in historic races and enjoys it hugely. Like Brian Redman, he returned to top-level competition with Aston Martin 20 years later. Atwood was second in 1971, which was another Porsche-dominated race, but it was not the end for the Gulf-sponsored team. When the GT40s and the 917s were out of the game, John Wire's team built their own Cosworth-powered Mirage. No one had won the race with a Cosworth-engined car, the vibrations from which would often result in gearboxes having to be rebuilt in the pits during the race. Gulf and John Wire ran a very tight team and partnered by Derek Bell, Jackie Ix won in 1975, driving the Mirage. Brian Redman looks back at how the teams were managed. Now, the style of management of the teams has changed quite a lot because today there are immense commercial and financial pressures on the teams and this is reflected in every aspect of it from top management down to the man that sweeps the garage floor today as in all sports it doesn't matter what it is the pressure is far greater and in practical terms that means that 20 years ago driving for John Wire or for Porsche any of the top teams and John Wire in particular the style of life was very important it was important to him and to the team that you stayed at the best hotels that you ate at the best restaurants, and that everything was conducted in a relatively gentlemanly manner. Now today, that gentlemanly manner has gone by the board. It's how fast you go, uh, how quickly you can do it, and how little they can pay you. During the late 1970s and the 1980s, it seemed as if Porsche could do no wrong at Le Mans, and neither, for that matter, could Jackie X or Derek Bell. With an interruption from Renault in 1978, it was basically a Porsche benefit for years. And the winner was invariably either X or Bell, or a combination of both. When Brian Redman came back into racing after a serious accident, the first team he drove for was Porsche. And Porsche remained true to their drivers for many years. After the domination of their first turbocharged car, they decided, in the mid-1980s, to produce something that remains the yardstick for production sports cars. Porsche's Indianapolis engine wasn't a success, but when the Stuttgart concern used it in a sports car, the 956 was born. It was with this car that Jackie X took his final victories before retiring. Derek Bell was to win the Classic five times, second only to X, whose record six victories was only surpassed in 2005 by Danish driver Tom Christensen. Bell continued and succeeded in heading off the might of Jaguar in 1987. He nearly won again with the McLaren before finally hanging up his helmet and concentrating on teaching others to drive racing cars. Jackie X looks back. I believe within the last 20 years motor racing has changed completely. I must say in the uh, end of 60s, early 70s, even if you were driving a works car, the old scene was maybe professional, but there was a lot of amateur, amateurism into it. And it was a nice, nice time. Today, works team are much more eager to drive. You have to be much more professional. And I think there is a little bit less room for real sport. Actually, um, the nicest thing about uh, vintage racing or historic races is that the public can 
see the car, can approach the car, touch the car, and it makes it more a family affair in a way. Because if you do, if you go to a Formula One, for example, today, spectators are absolutely away from the racing team, from the race cars, and so on. Here, you are really enjoying a good weekend because you are very close to the car you like. With the cars, there were some big changes over the years. Well, in the GT40, at least the one that uh, Jackie Hicks and I are driving this weekend, which is a Mark II with a 7-litre engine, it weighs almost 3,000 pounds. It's got very little aerodynamic aids. In other words, it does not have ground effect like a modern Aston Martin or Group C racing car does. It weighs a thousand pounds more and the power is about the same. So there is a huge, huge difference. This is 20 years of development that we're looking at in the Group C Aston Martin against this 1967 Mark II Ford GT40. Now, what this means in practical terms is that when you come to a corner, the braking on this heavier, older car, you've really got to brake early and the cars like this a little bit and you think huh, you know in the group C car you break what seems to be unbelievably late you hurtle into the corner and you just go bang like that and the thing goes mm, and it doesn't do anything it just stops and then you turn and it's got ground effect pulling it onto the ground and it screams to the corner and your head goes like this you know because of the g-force now in these older cars it they are older cars we're looking at 20 plus years how good was the GT40 well, the GT40 was a was a brilliant car, and it became a brilliant car because of the influence and the money and the technical and engineering ability of the Ford Motor Company. The car actually started life as a Lola uh, GT, which was built by Eric Broadley in England, and the rights were bought by the Ford Motor Company, and development then took place. And of course, under both Ford themselves with the Mark II and the Mark IV, and after that with John Wire, with the earlier car, but in much later form, with wider wheels and with much less weight was also highly successful. Jackie Ix and Brian Redman were both great stars in their own right. Neither won the Formula One World Championship, but they deserve their place in the history of motor racing. Join us for the next Autofiles.